and it is therefore with deep admiration that I introduce Joseph Cannon. Gosh, it's really a crap. Thank you so much, Jonathan, and thanks all of you for having me. This is the third time I've been to Savannah. The first time I came as a tourist to look at the beautiful houses and the squares and had a great time. The second time I was here as a beginning writer and one of the panels that uh, appear on Saturday, and it was part of a book tour in which I thought that if 10 people showed up, I was a rock star, it was really important. And now I get to do the opening remarks. I would like to think it's because I'm getting better, but I suspect, really, that it's just that I'm getting older. <laughs> and they thought it would be nice to have some white hair to lend gravity to the proceedings and to start out. But to be anywhere where they're celebrating books is now a great joy. It is especially true to be here. Whenever you are at one of these events, however, where people care about reading and writing, um, even if it's a reading in a bookstore, not necessarily a big festival, I find that invariably the question that comes up, often the first question that comes up, is where did you get the idea? Why this book? How, how did you come to write it? And I've learned over the years that sometimes this, is a, this question is really code for uh, how much of it is true, how much of it is autobiographical, uh, you know, is this from your life, tell us, tell us what's real. I always slightly resent this because I don't think that novel writing is a higher form of keeping a diary. I think if you want to keep a diary, keep a diary. Writing a novel is a very different sort of discipline. And what I usually say to them is that everything you write is autobiographical. It's coming from everything you've experienced and everything you know. Just selecting the words to put in the sentence makes it distinctively yours, for better or for worse. But it's not a question of how much of this is reportage. It's a question of what kind of shading can we give it, what kind of inner life, and where, but nevertheless, where do these things come from? I think it's a fair question when it's not coded. And it's fair, it's also difficult because it's almost impossible to answer. We would like to think that there's such a thing as an ins inspirational moment, an aha moment, and everything clicks into place. This is almost never the case. What usually happens is you get a bit here, you get a bit there, something begins to gel, you rub it around, something comes out or you scratch out. You're never quite sure until there's a kind of liftoff moment. Nevertheless, we would like to think, I think, that it's really the light bulb going off over the head. And this did happen to me once, and it happened to me in such a significant way that it changed my life because it changed my career. I think that uh, many of you are aware that before I was a writer, I was a publisher. I worked in book publishing almost all my life, enjoyably. I did not have manuscripts secretly in drawers and you know, <laughs> looking to, to change. But one summer, my wife and I went out to New Mexico, out, out to the Southwest in general. We loved that part of the country, and we were hiking and just enjoying ourselves. And in Santa Fe, I said, why don't we go visit Los Alamos? I'd always been interested in World War II, and here we were 40 miles away, and I thought this is an opportunity. And I was absolutely fascinated by the place, not just the historical museum where you saw the license plate, license numbers made out to uh, fake names, uh, what people had to do to live there. Nobody left the Mesa. It was a really secretive, non-existent place. And as I walked around, and it now looks like anywhere in Ohio or Oregon or anywhere in the country. It's an all-American city built in the 50s because most of the temporary housing from the war was destroyed. And as you walk around, you think, now it's an Ozzy and Harriet kind of place and great, but at one point, this was the most secret place on Earth. If you went here, you fell off the planet. You, just, you were in a town that did not technically exist. And at that point, there was a light bulb that went off over the head. And I thought to myself, what would happen if there'd been a crime? How would they ever go about solving it in a place that does not technically exist? The police are not al allowed even to know they're there, 
much less to come up and do any investigations. The only enforcement is some MPs who are there to prevent fistfights breaking out among some drunk GIs. There's nobody who can do it. It then occurred to me that even more interesting is what would be the reaction on the part of the scientists who were working on the Manhattan Project. And I thought they'd probably be annoyed at the time that was being taken out of this incredibly important work that they were engaged on. And I thought, you know, this is actually, and I've never said this since, this is a really good idea. <laughs> and because I was still in publishing, I thought, who can I give it to? Who's between books? Who's looking for something? Who's looking for a way you know, to fulfill the contract? And nobody was, and it's usually not a very good idea to give ideas to someone else anyway, because they should be yours. You should be writing for yourself. But it nevertheless gnawed at me, and I thought, hmm, you ought to do something with this. But the only reason that I ultimately did, and I think this is an important part of where ideas come from, is that there has to be what I call an understory. The thing that really causes you to want to write the book, that, um, that makes you want to do research, that makes you want to explore the subject, to know more about this material, that really moves you. That's what I call the, a real idea, this understory. And for me in that one, it was the summer of 95, so it was 50th anniversary of Hiroshima. And there was a lot of stuff, op-ed stuff in the press, um, much of it revisionist almost all of it about the victimization in Japan, rightly so. I'm not against revisionist history. I think that every generation has the right to look at the world through their own lens, assuming that it's an accurate one. And yet and yet and yet, having looked into the Manhattan Project, because I was interested having been there, I s felt that most of the stuff was being very skewed. They were bringing 50 years of nuclear baggage in writing this, the kind of stuff that we went through as kids, ducking under desks because there were going to be nuclear explosions. And all of this fraught baggage was being brought to our sensibility now of what the Manhattan Project was. And it was being described as a kind of collection of Dr. Strangeloves who were out there in the middle of the desert plotting the end of the world. And I thought the reality is so much more interesting. The average age of the scientists on the project was 27. Oppenheimer himself was just turning 40 as this was happening. And I thought, this was Silicon Valley in 1945. And it's at that point that I think the ultimate fiction question, or the motivation for fiction question, arises, which is, what if it had been you? And I thought, what if you had been one of these scientists, you're at USC, your eyes are bad, so you haven't been drafted, and somebody comes to you and says, we'd like you to do some work for the government. You're not going home for Thanksgiving. In fact, you're not going home at all, and nobody is going to know where you are but you will be with the 40 or 50 top people in your field. They've all won Nobel Prizes, maybe you will too. You're going to solve this riddle of the universe, of the physical universe, and you're gonna win the war for us. I would have said yes, and I would have been one of those people that was now being pilloried in the newspaper accounts. And I thought, that's a real basis for a book. What happens when good people, for supposedly all the right reasons, do all the right things, and yet create this appalling legacy, this inheritance that's going to haunt mankind forever. At that point, I thought, it started as a good idea, but now it's a real idea. Now there's something to write about. I wrote the book because essentially, I wanted to join the Manhattan Project to see what it was like. I wanted to live that life, to just feel what these guys were feeling, and women, as a matter of fact, although fewer than one would have liked, what then happened is that I thought, you better do this book. You really, really want to do it, which is part of it. But don't tell anybody, because I was a publisher, and I thought, what could be more humiliating than a publisher who can't write? And <laughs> I didn't know if I could do it. So I made it my secret project, and stole some time and went to the library and did it. The end of the story is a kind of Cinderella story because the book worked. I did finish it and it won a prize and it enabled me to become a writer and do something I hadn't really anticipated doing. In that sense, the light bulb over the head was valuable. Unfortunately, it has never happened since. <laughs> and all of the ideas that come, come in different ways. They can start with a place. I once went to Istanbul and fell in love with it and thought, I've just got to write about this place. 
I had a friend whose brother had been a spy who defected to the Soviet Union, and after 25 years, he went to see him. And I was so haunted by this scene. It doesn't matter what they actually said to each other. I kept thinking, what did they say? What did they say after 25 years and after what he had done? Um, it eventually became a book. The Accomplice, the book that we're here tonight about, um, is one of those ideas that another, it's one thing follows, leads to another. I find that in the book she'll be interested in subsets of the main question and you want to know more about that and you kind of go off in another direction. In this particular one, what happened was that I was writing the book about the defector in Moscow and this was happening in 1961. And one of the things I like to do is to see what's in the air at the time of the story being uh, told. What were people watching on TV? What was in the newspapers? What would they be talking about? If it were last month here, for instance, possibly the impeachment would come into a conversation. You just wanted to know what the general newsiness about you was. And as I looked into this, I saw that in 1961, one of the things that would be discussed, because it was everywhere, was the Eichmann trial. And following the capture, or as the Argentines would say, the kidnapping of Eichmann in 1960, almost all of 61 was taken up with this trial, the man in the glass box that most of us, I think, remember that was um, being held in Israel. And I thought, you know, I lived through that. I remember it, but I was a teenager, and I don't think I took quite, I, d I didn't think I took in quite how important and pivotal this event really was. This was the event that caused people to all of a sudden, after years of silence and years of forgetting and, and willfully forgetting, to talk about the Holocaust, to talk about how it had happened and who had perpetrated it and how many of them had never been punished for it or had never even been found. The Hannah Arendt argument about the modality of evil, the whole recognition that somehow there had to be an accounting for this, there had to be some rendering of justice. All of these major issues were happening and what I thought, reading them again, was what took so long? The short answer to this, of course, is that nobody was looking very hard. It was in everybody's interest to kind of put this behind them. But it wasn't just that, it was also the other question that comes to your mind is, how did he feel? How did the other war criminals feel? All of a sudden, they've been getting away with this for 15 years. They've been untouched. They're fine. They're living a life. And now, all of a sudden, nobody is safe. Everyone is susceptible. If Eichmann can be got, so can you. This struck me as, if not an idea, the germ of an idea. I wanted to. I became interested in what happened to the Nazis who had escaped the net of the Allied forces that were trying to corral them and had managed to escape to South America where we've all grew up, we all grew up with the rumors that they were there, but we didn't know very much about it. I became interested and I wanted to know how did they get away with it? How did they feel when they weren't going to get away with it anymore? So you had this piece that was going to form an idea of a Nazi war criminal hiding in Argentina. The moment you begin to look into this, what you want to know is, what were their lives like? I had never given this any thought at all. I suppose if I had any mental image about the Nazis who fled to Latin America, it would be somebody hiding in a hut in a jungle in Paraguay, looking over his shoulder and constantly being hounded and switching aliases, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this turned out to be illusionary and very far from the truth. The majority of people often used a different name, but sometimes used their own, and they were hiding in plain sight. This f interested me a lot. I think the whole concept of hiding in plain sight is one that fiction lends itself to exploring. It's very much a character. How do we know each other? How do we know who's really who? And I began to look at the lives that they were leading there, and I thought, first of all, how did they get there? You don't just hop on a plane or a boat when you're an escaping Nazi war criminal. Much to my surprise, it turned out there was no formal Odessa uh, organization of old Wehrmacht or Gestapo people or SS people who were helping each other. There was, in fact, an informal good boy network, someone who would say, here's a tip, you ought to talk to so-and-so, maybe this is a way out for you. But the more formalized 
um, departments of relief and people who were actively helping the Nazis get out were in fact the South Americans. The fascist dictator Peyron, who had always been sympathetic to the Nazis, literally organized a semi-official government agency and some members of whom actually went to Italy to facilitate the people getting on boats, etc. He was actively recruiting the Nazis. I had never heard this before. I had never known why. That's a whole other subject in a sense, but just to do it in a minute or two, we always look at the past and say, what were they thinking? And what they were thinking at that point, what Perón was thinking, was that he wanted A, whatever expertise he could borrow from the Luftwaffe or people who had been in the Wehrmacht, he wanted to become a major military power. And in conjunction with the church, the Argentine church and indeed the Vatican, who are everywhere in this story, there was going to be a war with the communists and consequently anybody who had, fought the who had fought the communists before, even if they were fascists from Germany, were considered very much worth recruiting and very much the sort of people we were gonna need in the future as there was as this great crusade. The church, as I said, its fingerprints were everywhere. There was a Bishop Hudal, famously in the Vatican, who was born Austrian. And I discovered that he goes so far as to go to the Argentinian consulate and demand 5,000 blank visa forms that he can just fill out in whatever name he wants so that people can be got into Argentina. None of this was easy, and none of it was pro forma, and none of it was just a matter of giving somebody a bribe. There were endless r bureaucratic loopholes that people, or hurdles that people had to jump over. They were jumped over because they had the help of people in the Vatican, people in Argentina itself, and finally, ultimately, wherever these people were landed and settled, they'd become Argentine citizens. Some of them, as I had said before, used their own name. Mengele, at one point, was a partner in a pharmaceutical company and had to get a bank loan, so needed to have his own name on it, and just happily did it. Clearly, they felt secure enough that they could live these outward lives. They would go to the ABC restaurant on Laval Street in downtown Buenos Aires, and it is said that Eichmann met Mengele there. One of the more extraordinary meals, I can't imagine what they said to each other, but there they were in this restaurant, which by the way still exists and looks like a kind of kitschy Munich uh, Bavarian Gasthaus, but there it is. And there is a vibrant business community of Germans in Argentina who are helping these people. And I thought, okay, so are you open about this? Do you tell your friends? Are you aware of who, is it a mutual protection racket? I won't tell on you if you don't tell on me. And then I came to what become the second piece of this puzzle. I thought, what about your child? What do you do if you have a child? Do you tell the children who you are? Do you tell them what this means? Or do you try to brazen it out and get away with it? This to me was something I really wanted to explore. It was the second piece of the idea that would make it happen. I wanted the relationship between this war criminal and his child, in this case a daughter, to be at the emotional center of this book, the pivot. This is someone who cannot be forgiven. I specifically made him an Auschwitz doctor so that there could never be any confusion about how guilty this guy really was. This is as bad as it could ever get. Imagine him being your father and him being the person who had indeed loved you all during your childhood. How do you deal with that? How does each side deal with it? But the book itself did not finally come together and gel in that idea, well, here's an idea, way, until I found the understory. And what really began to interest me was the Nazi hunters themselves. This is all in the wake of the Eichmann pivot there is now all of a sudden an open season. It's no longer just a matter of Simone Wiesenthal, who had been one of the earliest and certainly was the most famous of the Nazi hunters in the 50s. Now we have what I call the generation of conscience, the people who were not necessarily in the camps themselves, but who find it morally imperative to help in this crusade to somehow bring these people to trial which raises a lot of questions that I realized had formed other ideas in other books of mine. How do you render justice for a crime so immense that for many years there was not even a name for it? 
what form of what form did, can justice take? What what works? What doesn't? Who gets to decide? Is it just the victors in a war? What do you have to do in order to bring this about? What if you have to make some moral compromises in your trek? What's ultimately the most valuable thing here? I had asked in a previous book, what do you do when there's no right thing to do? Just two wrong things. Maybe one is lesser wrong than the other. I think we face moral quandaries like that every day in our lives. And how we deal with them and how our characters deal with them is for me the stuff of fiction. I think it's this understory of ethical choice and ethical thinking that is really what drives my fiction and I think most fiction. I think what writing is about and what novels are about are not writing diaries. I think they're about how do we live? How should we live? I am not claiming that a book which I hope you will find entertaining um, has answers to these questions because I don't know that anybody has answers to these questions. They're just too vast and too important. But what I do think is that we need to keep asking them. And if you can ask them even in the form of, I hope, an entertaining thriller, then we should by all means do so. Because I think if we stop asking these questions, we are gonna stop being the kind of people we want ourselves to be. At which point, do you wanna turn this over for Q&A? Thank you so much. I can walk the stage. <laughs> Does the light follow me? Okay. Yes. Okay, now the, the ushers have uh, microphones out in the audience. If you raise your hand, the ushers will bring one to you and I'll call. Okay, right here. Yes. Hi. Uh, I was just curious about your writing practice. Daily, in your bunny slippers, what, what do you do? <laughs> Is this how I spend my time? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, what happens is that I was so used to getting up and going to an office that I continued that kind of mode. I get up, I walk to the New York Public Library, uh, where I've written all of my books, as a matter of fact, and uh, you put in your time, your hours, and then you walk home. It's, you know, be a bourgeois in your work habits, and eventually the pages pile up and you finally finish. And I should say, by the way, as a plug for the NYPL, it's just one of the great cultural institutions in New York. And since you have access to <laughs> endless research, it's great. And a beautiful building, so it's always great to go there. Okay. Oh, and as for the process, because I've been asked this and I know people like to know it. I write in longhand on yellow legal pads. I'm not a Luddite, I do put it into the computer, but only after it's all done and then all these yellow pad pages are piled up. And it constitutes a kind of first pass edit because as you type it into the computer with the killing on your back, you nevertheless will say things like, oh no, she'd never say that, or no, I, that's wrong. And so you correct as you go on. Great, thank you. Hi, Mr. Cannon. I in Savannah, many of America's wars live quite large. Why do you write about World War II and that aftermath as opposed to Civil War, Vietnam War, or any of the other conflicts? Well, it's an interesting question. I, you know, partly I fell into it. Having written about Los Alamos, I was interested in Oppenheimer, so then I wrote a book about the McCarthy period, and. Um, I became interested in the American occupation in Germany because I knew so little about it, and I thought practically no, nobody knows anything about it. And we had five years life and death power over a foreign conquered country. How did we do? You know, what was our record? So I just, it just fell, one thing fell after another like dominoes. It's not that I don't care about the Civil War or even indeed the Crusades, but it's the way this fell out. I think, however, when I realized that most of my books were being set in this period, that it bore a little self-reflection, saying, why are you actually doing this? And I think the, the serious answer, not just one thing fell into another, 
is that I think somehow it's the hinge of the century, the pivot. Um, I kn we all like to think, because we're all historical beings, that what we're experiencing are seminal moments and pivotal, pivotal moments in history. And indeed, they are because they are seminal for us. And maybe other people will agree. Let's see 50 years from now how 9-11 is portrayed. I don't know. We'll see. But we are now far enough away from the 40s to understand what really happened. And it was my opinion that, for instance, the moment the atomic bomb is exploded at Alamogordo, the world shifts on its axis. It becomes a different place. It becomes a before and after place. This is not just a bigger hand grenade you know, or a superior bow and arrow. This is the possibility and threat of self-annihilation. Once that happens, you're in a different universe. And I think for at least those of us in the West, or I had thought so, that the revelation of the Holocaust operated this way in a moral sense. I think for centuries, the West was justifying its, its own conquering of the rest of the world on the grounds that they were morally superior as well as technologically superior and the people who deserved to, to rule. And then this, and this kind of savagery um, among people who considered other people savages, I think that even now, every time you encounter uh, serious accounts of it, it has the power to shock and appall. I think that we can no longer, we cannot think of ourselves the way we thought of ourselves in 1940. It just becomes a different world. So it fascinated me. It, it just seemed to me one of those times where everything that happens takes on an importance and ordinary people like you and me are making decisions that are going to have ramifications for 50 years to come. It was just great to do it. Also, everybody writes about the Civil War, and uh, you know, <laughs> there's just almost nothing to be said at this point. So. Question in the middle. Uh, am I doing things right? Um, about a publisher, we've heard about a writer we love, but I wonder if you see yourself as an educator, because for me, you really have been. Do I see myself as an entertainer? As an educator. As educator. an educator. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, could we go back to the entertainer part? <laughs> I, I, don't gi really I, give, I give you that for the first okay. two. Okay. <laughs> yes and no. I mean, look, I think that people, people who write novels, and particularly novels that intend to be entertaining, um, have a real problem if they're didactic. I, I don't mean these to be teaching tools, and I, cert I think that th therein lies a lo slippery slope, because then you begin to really lecture people, and that's the last thing you should be doing in these books. But if the revelation of how characters work with each other, and how we, mas how we encounter and deal with ethical problems, etc., sure, I think that all books in that sense are instructive. The most instructive thing, if somebody says to me, what's the point, why do, why do people, and let's be highfalutin for a moment and say it's literature and not any other kind of book, why do we have literature? And my fast answer would be to be in somebody else's shoes. I want to see the world through somebody else's eyes for a change. I, I know about me, maybe not as much as I should, but I know enough. I want to know about the, I want to know about you, I want to know about everyone else. Aren't other people the ultimate mystery? Who really knows about them? I mean, I think it's one of the reasons I was drawn to stories about espionage and spies. These are people who are somebody else, 24/7, often lying even to their families. You know, it's like, how, how do you reconcile that? How do you do that? That to me is interesting. So I guess the answer is I would hope that there is some educative value in these books, but I hope that it's not apparent, or that it looks as if I'm trying to put it in. I suppose secretly I want people, yeah. We have a question up in the balcony. Yay. Hi. Um, you write about, about real events. I was wondering if you could tell me the difference between fiction and narrative nonfiction. The what between? Fiction and narrative nonfiction. Right. 
Well, one of the things that's happening is that narrative nonfiction is becoming more and more like fiction, um, and it's been happening since, I think, the 1960s, really, when the new journalism brought these forms into greater prominence. I don't have a big problem with this. Um, look, I, blurring genre and blurring categories is perfectly fine, I think. The only thing that really matters about any book is whether it has some kind of integrity. And if it's good unto itself. I mean, I find that uh, we all think we read the plot, but we all forget plot. We don't really remember. I think we read for people. We read for the characters. And increasingly, if you're part of this world, you begin to read for what, what happens on the page. How is the prose? Is something exciting going on in the writing itself? It doesn't have to be dazzling. It just has to be clear. It has to have rhythm and shape, and it has to be when you turn the pages, you think, oh, I'm talking to somebody that I want to talk to. This is very interesting. Now, this whole business about you know what is true and what is not true, I mean, what part of my other answer, by the way, about the people who want to write diaries, or how many diaries are true? You know, <laughs> everybody, everybody, <laughs> everybody makes things up. In fiction, you are meant to be making things up but the limits to this is that if they don't have an internal plausibility, that is, if they're not plausible to the reader, what's the point? You know, it has to have the illusion of being true and having happened. I don't know if that, that answers your question, no, but I think awesome. in a way what I'm saying is you could do either, really. It's, it's okay. Anybody else? Uh, I have a question about setting in The Accomplice. It seems to me that there are uh, two scenes that take place in cemeteries, uh, and in both works, they're in both uh, settings. It's pivotal, there's some physical action. One is in Hamburg and one is in Buenos Aires. I was wondering, that's not a coincidence, is it? <laughs> well, you know, it became a coincidence. What, what happened was, um, I don't outline my books. I sort of make them up as they go along. Um, although there are exceptions. I mean, if, I, if a character gets killed, I tend to have to know who killed him because otherwise <laughs> it's not going to work. But in general, I don't plan them out to, in any great detail. And there had been the early Hamburg cemetery scene, the famous cemetery in Hamburg. And it was only later that I realized that it bookended with the scene in Buenos Aires, whose most famous tourist attraction, by the way, is a cemetery called Recoleta. And I remember being there as a visitor and walking around, because I was essentially location scouting and sort of research where you're seeing where people might have lived, how would they get to work, et cetera, et cetera. And I was in that cemetery and I thought, oh God, I have to do a, I have to do a cemetery scene. You know, it's just a perfect setting for what I had in mind, which I hope worked for you. But in any case, it, now that it looks as if I have deliberately planned them, as bookmarks, yes, I intended that to happen. There's one in the back here. Yeah, I don't, I, I have the um, not tacky question, but um, this is your first, the first book of yours that I've read, so I don't know how, it, if it deviated or if the 15 shades of gray or any kind of, um, tribute to Fifty Shades of Grey because I actually listened to this book in the car while I was driving home and your, um, the narrator is extraordinarily eager in your uh, sexual scenes <laughs> to the point where my husband's going, what are you listening to? <laughs> and I wonder if that's a recurring theme in your books or if it's... <laughs> <laughs> or if it's just something you like to tantalize people with occasionally. In other words, do you have any other suggestions for her? Oh. Yeah, exactly. Oh, he did quite well, Bo. <laughs> That's just the nicest thing anybody said to me. <laughs> I will tell you that I, I believe that there is no book without a love story. I like a love story. And Often I think that scenes of extreme intimacy between people are the most revealing, and so I do tend to have those scenes. 
Um, and actually, I don't even know that this is the best one, so you better read all <laughs> the other ones. <laughs> but I will tell you that um, there was a wonderful moment with, uh, we have two children, and when one of them was in college, he had taken the position that he was not going to read my books because what if I don't like them? Then it's going to be so embarrassing. And I said, fine, <laughs> you know, don't read the books, it's fine. And he was sitting around um, his dorm room one night when, and doing God knows what. And <laughs> one of his friends apparently said, dude, your dad, those sex scenes. And he said, <laughs> what? <laughs> Which I think he thought I was incapable of even knowing about. So, <laughs> so he is now one of my most faithful readers. <laughs> There's one in, uh, Mike, you're down in the front here. There's a question in the front row. There's one in the meantime. Go ahead. I actually had two questions. You said you write in the library, but um, I have read two of your books, Istanbul Passage and the one set in Berlin, and they're very atmospheric. So I wonder how much time you spend walking around the settings that you actually write about. And secondly, of your own characters, is there a particular character that still fascinates you the most or that you would have wanted to have been? Yeah, the business of walking around, I, place is absolutely crucial to me in the books. And some critics have even said, you know, it constitutes a character on its own in some of these novels. Uh, I thought it was true of Istanbul. I went several times. I mean, you know, it was an excuse to go, essentially. And, one of the things that you have to do is try to look at it through this scrim of the past because Istanbul today in many ways looks like Istanbul in 1945, but in some ways it doesn't. Berlin, you know, is a reconstructed city to a certain extent. So you have to be very careful about what you're looking at. But I think it's, you know, it may not be important for you, for the readers, but I think it's important for me to know where the character actually lives. I mean, I know the apartment where this guy was. And could you take a tram to work? Um, what were the restaurants that everybody was trying to get into? Wh what was life like in those days? I think the only way to know this is to be on the ground and to perceive a city. I walked the city to perceive it as it would have been perceived by the people there. Um, and I hope it works. Um, you know, you're always leery of description because I tend to favor dialogue over that, and I don't want it to slow down. But I think it's important. I think where we live indicates, dictates in many ways how we live, and it certainly does so in, in the pages of fiction. As for characters you want to spend time with, it's, you know, people have said, would you ever do a sequel? And these are movies that say the end at the end. I mean, I'm done with them. If there were one person, one character, that I could talk to and have dinner with, it would be Oppenheimer. I find him endlessly interesting. Um, anything that comes out, anything new, I mean, there's just recently been a revelation that there was yet another spy they didn't know about. And a few people sent me emails about it and I just answered, told you so. <laughs> but, but I think that period and his, his braininess and his essential tragedy, you know, and what happened to him, it may render him, a, one of the most fascinating people of the century. And I would love to have met, I've never met him. I he was dead when I was writing this book. But I would have liked to have known him. Okay. One of the um, sir, um, I know someone who was a successful uh, publisher. You were obviously a successful publisher. How did you make it the transition once you had written that first book from publishing to being, becoming a full-time author? You tend, it's, I, I, I know it's, it's an interesting process because as a publisher, you know how the business works and you know what can go wrong. But you also know that you have to let the publisher take ownership of his own work. You can't be a squeaky wheel who's always second guessing what people do. So what I decided at the outset was that if they were willing to publish me, I would try to be as low maintenance as possible <laughs> so that maybe they'd like me enough to publish well, you know? And I've been very lucky in my publishers. I, you know, I have 
no real complaints or beefs. I mean, life is life. You know, you can get a bad review and it's nobody's fault. It just happens that the person assigned the review was not congenial. And, <laughs> <laughs> and may suffer mightily in the future, but, <laughs> but it's not really in your control. Um, I think so far as the actual working on the book itself is concerned, they're really very different skill sets. I mean, I worked with a lot of writers when I was an editor and a publisher, and they're all different. Everybody's different. And consequently, the people who worked, I took it seriously because having done it myself, if you are working with an editor who says, take a look at this, it just, it, there's something slow about it, there's something off here, you really pay attention, you listen to him because he's telling you something you want to hear. At its best, it's an extraordinarily intimate kind of relationship because nobody is going to care about the minutiae of the writing or what's actually on the page as much as you and this other person. Not even your readers. I mean, the hope is that they won't notice things, that everything will be felicitous and it just, you know, runs page to page to page. But someone says, no, why a semicolon? And you can literally talk for 10 minutes about why the semicolon. You think, he loves me. Nobody loves me this way. You know, this is, <laughs> this is great. So I'm, I'm pro the process. Anybody else? Here's, here's one down here. Yep. Over here. Can you talk a little bit about your research process? Did you have people who went out and researched? A moment ago you talked about you went and walked the city and actually went to these places. But talk about that discovery process of how you do that, please. I do it strictly through print. I mean, I try to read everything I can about the subject at hand. Um, sometimes this is, you know, a fool's errand because you can never read everything about some of these subjects. The library is invaluable in that sense. I like bibliographies where you play tag, you'll be going through and you come across a title you hadn't heard about before and you should have because you really know this field. So, whoops, there it comes, call up this book and that leads to another. And it becomes a kind of paper trail chase. There's um, some fun involved in it. It's not just intellectually stimulating, it's really fun to do. Maps are crucial old photographs when they exist, et cetera. What I have never done is hire researchers to interview people. Uh, I do not have foreign language skills that would enable me to really go through archives. I mean, when I go to Berlin on my research trips, I'm not really going through the Stasi archives, although some of them have been translated, and so those I did look at, and they're fascinating. But I don't, I simply don't have the ability to do that. And it's also, I am not looking in these books to discover something so hidden or unknown that it would need that kind of heavy research. What I'm trying to do is get a general sense of the time and the period and what are the quandaries, what are the questions that interest me there. What you then want is not to make mistakes because they hold up the reader on the page and you don't want that, you want them to just keep reading. So consequently, I like to get things I want them to be accurate. I don't want place names to be wrong. And in Berlin, for instance, they've often changed three or four times since the war, so you really have to be careful about that. But it's just a general sense of getting the atmosphere right. Um, I can tell you that if you don't get things right, people always send you emails because <laughs> they love to correct you. And I've discovered that um, of those people that love to correct you, gun people are far and away the most amazing. <laughs> There was, for the good German, I went to the Museum of the Allies in Berlin and they had you know, the uniforms that would have been worn by the occupation forces, including their guns, and I dutifully noted you know, what kind of gun it was, I don't know, P30, whatever it was called. What I had failed to note was whether it was a slingback or a cylinder, so, and I got it wrong in the thing. Mercifully, the copy editor nailed it, caught it, and said, oh, no, 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 you know, it's this. <coughs> but she hadn't caught it in the set of galleys that went to the UK. So the UK and Commonwealth edition, I kept getting emails from Australia saying, any bloody fool knows that this is the way to blah, 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 blah. 
And I thought, you know what? I don't really care. From now on, I'm just going to push people out of windows. <laughs> I just want to know why they were killed, not how they were killed. We have another question up in we the balcony. We have one more. Up in the balcony here. Mr. Cannon, when you are having a dispute with a publisher, how do you resolve it when you think he are right and he thinks he's right? And have you had to compromise? How much have you had to compromise in your writing? How do I resolve a dispute with a publisher and have I had to compromise? <laughs> um, I resolve it usually by giving in. <laughs> and therefore, yes, I have compromised. But that's about the publishing of it. I mean, look, when we're talking about the manuscript itself, uh, and to all in the audience who are writers or would-be writers, the book is yours. You know, it's got your name on it. And ultimately, if you feel strong, I mean, I would listen with great seriousness to any editorial comment, because I think it's usually to the point and usually it profits you to listen. But if you're in your heart of hearts, you think, this is the way I want it to be. Th it's your book. And ultimately, they will, bat what are they going to do? Stop the whole thing? You know, I mean, it's, you do have a lot of leverage in the sense that you are the writer. And it's your name on the, on the title page. Now, if you want to quibble about the jacket, this, this is endless. You know, I mean, when I was on the other side, I've never met anybody who liked the jacket. <laughs> and it's always, and, you know, oh, why are you using this artwork? And, et cetera, et cetera, and in fact, I'll tell you a true story. You'll think I'm making it up, but it's absolutely true. There was a book whose author was living in Europe at the moment at that time and who called in, in, at a time when you didn't usually call to Europe and called and said, I'm sorry, dear, the jacket will not do. It won't do, and I can't have it. We're at this point going on press with the catalog, and, the, and it's anyway a mess. And the art director comes in and says, oh, if I can't do the jacket, I'm going to resign. It's the usual craziness. <laughs> so I just turned to the jacket designer, and I said, take the author's name up two points. She redid it. Next call. Oh, dear, I think that's fine. That would work great. <laughs> so you compromise. You know. <laughs> one last one. Anybody? All right, here, Mr. Cannon. Uh, my name's Don Miller. I'm an author that's presenting here, and I've written a book about the uh, Civil War. <laughs> 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 you know that war, <laughs> about which n nobody writes about anymore. Uh, but um, I was at Los Alamos with my wife around 20 years ago, and I was just transported by the place as you were, and immediately read your book and loved it a lot. And, have read every one of your books since and enjoyed every one of them, including the last. And, but the one that um, I wanted to ask you about, it because it seems hmm, you're taking a little bit different junction there, is the Hollywood book. How, where, where did that come from? I wrote a book called Stardust, which was about Hollywood in the late 40s as the studio system was collapsing and the McCarthy um, witch hunts were beginning. That, in a sense, was the primary reason, because I'd always had a fascination about the McCarthy period. And actually, I'm sort of an old Hollywood buff, but that's neither here nor there. What really interested me, I mean, if we go back to that formula, what's the understory? What's the thing that drives you to want to spend time? You know, this can be a year or a two-year process, so why do you want to spend time there? What had fascinated me were the European emigres, the refugees who landed in Hollywood during the war. And I thought, here we have people who perceive themselves as literally the last remnant of Western civilization. Some of them get out by walking over the Pyrenees with the dogs at their heels, you know, and they're just this close to being captured by the Gestapo and killed. And they're saving uh, musical scores and sketches and things that they're bringing because they are the last. They're the last remnant of Western civilization. And where do they end up? In a place that even Americans consider exotic. It was swimming pools and oranges and palm trees and Betty Grable movies. And nobody cares about the Viennese Orchestra. And nobody cares about any of the things they care about. And they go through a really tough time and a very, to me, interestingly tough time. I was particularly drawn to anything about Bertolt Brecht because I think he's a fascinating character. And he hated it. He was just nobody there. 
and was later to become one of the acclaimed playwrights of the 20th century. But you know, what they really wanted was a Hope Crosby picture, and he wasn't going to write that. <laughs> so it just seemed to me one of those plays, I wanted to spend time there. I thought it was a really interesting thing, and how the studios fell apart from this peak. I mean, in 1946, more people went to the movies than will ever go again. It was, you know, in a country of 150 million people, something like 90 million went every week. It was really extraordinary. Five years later, all of that is in ruins. And I thought, that's you know, almost a Civil War story <laughs> worth, <laughs> <laughs> worth telling. Right. Great. Thank you, Joseph. Okay, Can we thank, thank Joseph? Thank you. thank you very much. He's got a gift for you. This is, you have to go to that ice cream store. I just have to make an announcement. Before you all leave, I have a very important announcement to make. Can you just hold up for a second? We have an important announcement. And that is, uh, I don't know if you've been following the story of American Dirt. Janine Cummins. Um, many of you have read the book. I've read the book. And um, you know that her book tour was canceled. But we have been able to obtain a video of her in a, an independent bookstore in DC. And it's about a 50 minute video which happens to fit into our slot for her. It's very entertaining. She talks a lot about the process. You'll, you'll come to understand the research and the power of what she did in Mexico to get that book out. Uh, we will be showing that in her time slot at the Savannah Theater, which is the last morning slot at the Savannah Theater. I encourage you to see it. She's, she's quite a lady. And we, we hope to see you the rest of the weekend. Tomorrow night is John Grisham, and you know the, the Friday, our Saturday authors. Now, Joseph's going to be signing books right down here. On that side is 1 to 25. You have numbers in the books you purchase outside. On this side is 25 to 50. And from then, I wash my hands and leave it up to them. <laughs> Thank you very much.